So today is our last class, and the subject matter of our last class is the background theme of the course. Foreground theme has been the alternative ways of organizing a market economy, uh, and therefore the alternative futures of the market economy. The background theme is the alternative futures of economics itself. And the ways of thinking about this problem which occupied us during the semester. Uh, this is the subject in the course that Danny and I most disagree about. Uh, and uh, Danny has inverted the natural order by asking me as a critic of the dominant form of economics to speak first. So I will undertake that charge, although I'm very much aware of its inversion of what would be natural. Now, the central subject in any form of social and political thought is the imagination, the criticism, the justification of structure of the institutional and ideological framework of a society. That, un that in the history of social and political thought goes under the name of the regime, the theory of regimes. The explanation of structures or regimes is the supreme object of practical ambition in politics to uphold the regime or to transform it. And the revision of the regime or its preservation is the supreme object of practical ambition in politics. Politics is serious when it is about regimes. Uh, in the understanding of regimes, the central problem is always the relation between insight into the actual and imagination of the possible. Imagination of the adjacent possible, not what is ultimately possible in some distant and speculative horizon, but what can happen next. Uh, this is the subject of greatest interest. Now, classical European social theory and especially Marxism, had a theory of structure. And this theory of structure, the consummate achievement of classical European social theory, was built around a central revolutionary insight. The central insight is that the structures of society, the regimes, are made and imagined. We are their creators. They are not part of the furniture of the universe. We should not treat them as if they were natural phenomena. And therefore, as Vico had already suggested in the 18th century, we can have of them a unique kind of insight, the insight that a creator has into his creations. Uh, in Marxist social theory, the basis of the theory of structure was established by Marxist critique of English political economy. According to Marx, the English political economists had described as if they were universal and eternal laws of economic life, what were in fact only the laws of a particular regime, the regime that Karl Marx called capitalism. The structures are artifacts. They are a kind of frozen fighting. There is endless strife in history about the terms of our relations to one another. This strife is temporarily interrupted or relatively contained. And what results are the structures, the institutional frameworks 
and the ideological assumptions associated with them. This revolutionary insight into the artifactual character of structures was circumscribed or compromised in Marx's own theory by three deterministic concessions that eviscerated much of its content. The first was the idea that there was a closed menu or list of regimes in history. In Marx, the modes of production, the slave economy, feudalism, capitalism, socialism. The second is the indivisibility thesis. The idea that each of these regimes is an indivisible system, all of the parts of which stand or fall together. And from that indivisibility idea, there results a momentous binary view of politics. Politics is either the reformist management of a system or the revolutionary substitution of one system for another. In fact, the dominant form of structural change is fragmentary. And this idea of total change, total systemic change, is a limiting case, and for the most part, just a fantasy. The main use of this fantasy today has been to be converted into its opposite. The disenchanted ex-social democrat imagines real change would be the replacement of one system by another. And because that's not feasible, or if it were feasible, it would be too dangerous, what's left to do is to humanize the world. And thus, the leftists, the progressives, appear on the stage of history as the humanizers of the inevitable, backed up by this mistake about the nature of politics. The third illusion of false necessity is the idea that there, is, there are historical laws governing the foreordained succession of these indivisible regimes in history. So what has generally happened since Marx's time is that these three ideas, these three illusions of false necessity that I've just described, have become literally incredible. No one or very few people believe in them. But they continue to use the vocabulary that depends on them. And what results is an immense confusion. The general tendency of subsequent Marxist theory has been to deal with this problem by dilution rather than by substitution, by diluting the original ideas. For example, emphasizing the relative autonomy of consciousness or the relative autonomy of politics rather than pursuing the central revolutionary insight to the hilt and freeing it from the incubus of the illusions of false necessity. Now then comes contemporary social science. Uh, and contemporary social science has, in effect, conducted a relentless campaign against structural vision of any kind. It has suppressed structural vision. It has severed the vital link between insight into the actual and imagination of the adjacent possible. And in many different ways, it has cast on the arrangements of society a retrospective halo of naturalness, necessity, and authority. The philosophical impulse that informs it is what in the history of philosophy we call right-wing Hegelianism. The real is rational. This is the dominant spirit of social science. But each of the social sciences has done this in a different way. The most influential, the best organized of the social sciences is economics. And economics has severed this link between insight into the actual 
and imagination of the adjacent possible in a particular way. Now, before I outline the elements of a criticism of the dominant form of economics, uh, I want to make a set of preliminary remarks uh, that are somewhere in the space between methodology or epistemology and morality. The two greatest thinkers in the history of economics, uh, Karl Marx and Adam Smith, were very different from one another. They were temperamentally the opposite. Adam Smith was sweet. Uh, Karl Marx was indignant, angry. But in one respect, they were alike, which is that they were both unworldly. And uh, they worked under uh, their, their work obeyed the, the law of the spirit, which is that the worldly cannot change the world. They mattered, their work mattered, because they were unworldly. Uh, now I want to tell a little story about economics which goes in the opposite direction, which goes in the direction of its worldliness. Uh, in 1969, uh, there was established a so-called Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, this prize was, uh, the original Nobel Prizes were established in Norway under the will of Alfred Nobel, a Norwegian entrepreneur and inventor, in the, in the early 20th century. In the 1960s, the Swedish Central Bank was engaged in a struggle with the dominant Social Democratic Party of Sweden. Uh, a struggle to preserve its autonomy against the demands of the Social Democrats. And with great tactical brilliance, the Swedish Central Bank decided that it would be useful in order to enhance the prestige of economics worldwide and within Sweden to establish a so-called Nobel Prize in economics in Sweden rather than in Norway. So it has ever since been called the Riksbank's Prize for Economic Sciences in honor of the memory of Alfred Nobel. Uh, the family of Alfred Nobel brought a lawsuit to suppress this fake prize uh, and uh, on the argument that this was, uh, this, this was plainly a, a, a stratagem uh, and a disrespect for the memory of Alfred Nobel. And they lost their lawsuit. They lost their lawsuit because it's very hard to prevent someone from pre pretending to honor the memory of a dead person, which is what the Ricks Banks had done in order cleverly to uh, achieve its goal. So the, the prize was established, and each year, two representatives of this so-called prize stand up and receive uh, the award of hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. And, uh, and from time to time, the prize is given to a member of the, the loyal opposition. Uh, a, a, humanized, a humanizing critic of this economic science. Uh, and the result is that the beneficiaries of this prize wear the chain of gold, of worldliness that ties them to the world. They're rewarded for their, for their obedience. Like Aristotle in Rembrandt's pant, painting wearing his, his golden chain. Huh? Uh, now, uh, uh, the second preliminary remark that I want to make is uh, about the most significant heresy in the 20th century, the greatest heresy in economics, which was Keynes. And today, most critics of the dominant form of economics invoke the name of Keynes. But uh, the, the leftists, 
when they lose faith in Marxism and in the state direction of the economy, become vulgar Keynesians. So we we'll say a word now about Keynes's truncated heresy and why it could not serve as a candidate for an alternative to this dominant form of economic science. The first thing to observe is that uh, Keynes's economics uh, elaborates, deepens a characteristic of English political economy, which was prior to the dominant form of economics, the form of economics invented by the marginalist theorists at the late 19th century. The emphasis in Keynes's economics is psychological. All the crucial categories in Keynes's system, the preference for liquidity, uh, the consumption function, the state of long-term expectations, are psychological categories not structural categories. The second thing is to say that Keynes's economics has no, almost no institutional content. There are institutional remarks about particular features of the market economy, like the stock market, but there is no general institutional vision. The third thing is that Keynes's so-called general theory is in fact not a general theory. It is the theory of a very particular kind of slump, a slump characterized by what Keynes described as inadequate demand in the presence of the rigidity of a particular price, the downward price of labor. Uh, and the reason for this is really pre-theoretical. Keynes, in his inter, in his occasional writings, in, including in his journalistic pieces, uh, had considered a wide range of responses to the Depression, including responses that would require political control of the investment decision. But he regarded these responses as unpalatable because they would associate him with the left. Uh, and they would be resisted in various ways. So in his theoretical work, he focused on resolving the slump by propping up demand. The, the basis for this choice was really pre-theoretical. It was tactical. It was strategic. And it had to do with Keynes's worldliness. I return to the theme of worldliness. Keynes was very brilliant. He wanted to shine. He didn't want to shine after he was dead, like Adam Smith and Karl Marx. He wanted to shine in his own life. And his intellectual career was shaped by these choices, by this desire not just to be brilliant, but to appear brilliant and effective, influential to his contemporaries. The fourth characteristic is that Keynes um, did not fully develop an alternative paradigm, an alternative way of thinking about economics. His theory is caught in an intermediate position between being a theory of one particular kind of disequilibrium and being a theory of persistent and permanent disequilibrium. The result is that Keynes himself laid himself open to the reduction of his theory to its assimilation. His immediate disciples then produced a canonical version of his theory, the one that's in the economic textbook. And his American disciples then further reduced his theory, reduced it to being the theory of the fiscal, the, the count the counter-cyclical management of the economy by fiscal and monetary policy. And thus, what had begun as at least the germ of an alternative intellectual paradigm ended up being assimilated to the dominant ideas, as if it were just a different chapter in the same textbook. It was relabeled 
macroeconomics. And it was superimposed on the received body of economic theory, the economic theory of the marginalist, which is called microeconomics. So that's what we have today, this so-called neoclassical synthesis, this combination of the marginalist and the Keynesian ideas, which is not simply the product of intellectual illusion, but as I said, the product of a dangerous form of worldliness. Now, with this, I come now to the central topic, uh, the topic of the nature and defects of the established form of economics. The first thing to say is that economics is not the study of the economy. Economics is the study of a particular method pioneered by the marginalist theoreticians like Valras, Jevons, and Menger at the end of the 19th century. The application of this method to phenomena that have nothing to do with production and exchange is regarded as economics. And the study of economics by some other method, like Max Weber's study of the economy, is not regarded as economics. And this is characteristic of the university culture, which is based on the forced marriage of methods and subject matters. But it is an extreme case. Now, uh, what are the defects of this form of economics? I will cite now four defects, four deficiencies. The first is the dissociation of empirical, causal of empirical causal theory or explanation from formal analysis. What is this central vision? Central vision is um, the economy should be viewed as a series of connected markets. And the exemplary problem is then the, the choice of comparative means to satisfy desires or goals in divisible individual desires and goals under the constraints of scarcity. That's the problem. And it is manifest then in the explanation of relative prices. So relative prices are supposed to be the result of these comparative judgments under the constraints of scarcity. Although, interestingly, the marginalist apparatus has never actually been used to explain relative prices in any real economy. Now, uh, what did the marginalists do? They exploited the analogy, the affinity between this problem that I've just described, maximizing choice of comparative resources or solutions under the constraint of scarcity to deductive reasoning, and in particular to syllogistic reasoning. So the general situation of scarcity and comparative choice is the major premise in the syllogism. The minor premise is the particular circumstance that the chooser is in. And the whole line of reasoning is deductive. There is no causal theory at the heart of this idea. The Austrian wing of marginalism correctly understood that this economics was much more like a species of logic than it was like any causal science. Uh, uh, and this fact, because it is a fact, is uh, obscured today by the, the empirical focus of a great deal of economics. So the motivations of the marginalists in producing this dissociation of formal analysis from causal science were that they wanted to create a science that would be as invulnerable as possible to contestation. They were working in an atmosphere of ideological 
debate in Europe of, of struggle over the different forms of social theory. They wanted a pure science. A science, they could say, you can't pin anything on me. That's what, that, that, that was their motivation. As a subsidiary matter, they also wanted to cut through the confusions about value and price that had, be, that had beset the prior economics, now called classical economics. Uh, now, this fact that I've just described explains something strange about this economics. You know, it is a mathematics worshiping discipline. Uh, but there's something curious about it, which is that despite the mathematical talent and capacities of its practitioners, the economists, uh, there is almost no mathematics used in this science that was invented after the middle of the 19th century. It's not because they're incapable of using the higher forms of mathematics that they use instead this toy mathematics, this primitive mathematics. The reason is that any higher kind of mathematics would be useless. The only kind of mathematics that is generally useful to them is the mathematics that expresses deductive reasoning. How then do they proceed? They have this theoretical picture, which I just described, which is only a simulacrum of causal thinking, but is in substance a deductive picture. And against that invariant theoretical background, which can never be impugned, because it was never meant to be descriptive of anything, they then proliferate models. So the characteristic way in which the economist working under the marginalist program works is to replace the models by changing the elements of the models or the values of the models. So it's like Groucho Marx's remark, not Karl Marx. Uh, uh, I have principles, and if you don't like them, I have other ones. So if there, is, there is a proliferation of models. Uh, uh, and the substitution of the models never subverts the background idea, because the background idea was never a causal theory to start with. So for example, it's not like the relation in physics, in fundamental physics, between the standard model of particle physics and the theoretical background in quantum mechanics. The content of the standard model is all surprising and generated by the theoretical background. In this case, there is no intimate relation between the theoretical background and the model, and the models are a dime a dozen. You adjust by simply replacing one model with another model. Now, what's the result of all of this? In the short term, it seems to be invulnerability invulnerability to causal attack, invulnerability to the subversion of the theory. But in the long term, economics is condemned to a perpetual infancy because it is deficient in the crucial dialectic of empirically informed causal inquiry and formal analysis that is vital to all of the sciences. The second defect of economics, of this marginalist economics, so before I go on, so let me just bring that to a point. So in, in, in the form of a slogan, you could say, there's lots of theory and there's lots of empiricism in economics. The problem is that they have very little to do with each other. Now, the second problem has to do with the deficit of institutional vision. And we examined this earlier in the course. Uh, 
when we were dealing with the abstract idea of the reformation of the market economy. From the standpoint of the institutional form of the market, you could say there are three kinds of economics. One kind of economics is pure economics. It's the pure marginalist theory in its initial uncompromised form. It makes no institutional assumptions whatsoever, and it has no institutional implications. So it was established, for example, in the middle of the 20th century, that the apparatus of the marginalist, of marginalist economics could be applied even to a command economy without any difficulty. That's pure economics. So when it is pure, it is impotent to acquire explanatory and programmatic potency. You have to supply from the outside factual assumptions, causal theories, or and, and normative stipulations. So that's the fuel that makes the machine work. The machine itself is entirely empty of any explanatory consequence. The second kind of economics is fundamentalist economics. It associates economic rationality, comparative choice under the constraints of scarcity, with uh, the market. And it associates the abstract idea of the market with a very particular kind of market order. The market order that emerged in early modern Europe. And that's my little joke from an earlier class. If Robinson Crusoe traded on his island long enough, he would eventually reproduce the whole system of 19th century German private law. Then the third kind of economics is equivocating economics. And it is exemplified by the analytic and argumentative practice of the American disciples of Keynes, the so-called macroeconomists. So they look for law-like relations among large-scale economic aggregates, like the levels of employment, saving, and investment. For example, the relation between the level of inflation and the employment level, the so-called Phillips curve. You object and you say, well, this so-called law-like relation depends on a host of detailed institutional assumptions. For example, whether the workers are organized, how they're organized, whether there's unemployment insurance. If you change any of those elements in the institutional background, these so-called law-like correlations will shift. And what happens then at that point in the debate is that the macroeconomist concedes. Theoretically, he concedes. But if in his society there is, in fact, institutional stability or stagnation, as there is now in the rich North Atlantic economies, he can disregard this concession and go back to what he was doing before. That's what I'm calling equivocating economics. So in this combination of pure fundamentalist and equivocating economics, we have three different ways of evading the imperative of structural vision and severing the vital link between insight into the actual and imagination of the adjacent possible. The third defect of the marginalist economics is that it is entirely bereft of a genuine vision of production. It is a theory of exchange, of competitive exchange through the price mechanism. It views the world of production as a shadowy extension of the world of exchange. And it is enabled to do this by a contingent feature of the economies that it studies, namely that in those economies, labor can be bought and sold, and thus viewed under the lens of relative prices. In the economics that preceded marginalism, 
the classical economics of Smith and Marx, the theory of exchange and the theory of production were of equal weight. They were two independent focal points of economics, irreducible one to the other. Today, if you open the textbook to the chapter called Production, you'll be surprised to find that there's almost nothing about production as we understand it there. It's about the comparative substitution of different factors of production and the different shapes of particular markets and their departures from competitive efficiency. And the economics profession operates in a form that, may, that brings it much closer to hedge funds than to factories. So they frequent the hedge funds. They've rarely ever seen a factory. And, that's, and, and the intellectual background to this is this absence of any genuine view of production. The fourth defect of the marginalist econ economics is this. In principle, the fecundity of a method of comparative selection is entirely dependent on the richness, on the diversity of the material from which comparative selection selects. So for example, in the neo-Darwinian synthesis, there is the part about comparative selection, Darwinian natural evolution, and then there is the part about the creation of the diverse stuff from which the selection selects, the theory of genetic mutation and recombination. Here we have a theory that has only the first part. There's no second part. There's no theory of the creation of the diverse stuff. And if we don't have the second part, it's very hard to say what the first part means or is worth. From the standpoint of this economics, the world might just, be just as well be unified into a single economy. Why have all of those separate countries with their separate laws, their separate institutions? It's just transactions costs. There's no benefit to it. Uh, this is the practical consequence of the theoretical infirmity that I've just described. Now, so I've now concluded the outline of my critique of the dominant marginalist economics. Uh, and the question is, what should our attitude be to this deficient science, which is nevertheless the best organized and the most influential of the contemporary social sciences? Well, there's no clear alternative to it. Uh, so. Some of the economists, like our colleagues, would say, you haven't shown me that there's a better alternative. Uh, maybe I haven't. Uh, but it's, it's not a good argument in favor of a science that there's no immediate alternative to it. We have to see it for what it, for what it is. So we rate it, we use it, we employ it. Uh, it at, at a minimum, it is the science of constraints and of analytical clarity. It presents the bill. And it's very useful to have a science that presents the bill, that tells us what the consequences of our decisions are. But that's not enough. We want to understand the relation between the actual and the possible. That is the dominant spirit of any science. If you don't understand what a phenomenon can become, if you have no view of its transformative opportunities, you don't understand it at all. You just stare at it. That is the retrospective rationalization which now prevails across the whole field of the social sciences. And it is because we are in rebellion against that that we are here today. So you can see why we left this to the last. Because, uh, <laughs> um,
if we, if we held it at the beginning, <laughs> we might not hold the subsequent <laughs> classes, so, uh, or at least may need a, 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 a certain period of, uh, of separation for tempers to cool. Um, yeah. But um, um, so I think uh, Roberto finds himself in this interesting position of, of being full of contempt for the discipline, but yet having to show grudging contempt, uh, grudging respect for its authority. Of course. Uh, and, uh, and 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 and. Uh, um, so I, I think the, 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 the you know, um, since he, he spoke forcefully, let me do it, um, let me put my points forcefully as well. I think Roberto is making the same mistake that neoliberals um, have made, uh, which is to um, associate economics, which is to want to associate economics with, with a particular structural vision for society. And I want to argue that that's a mistake. Um, that in fact economics is disassociated and should be disassociated uh, from a particular structural vision of society. And that's exactly because, as at the end Roberto said, um, economics, or implied, economics is essentially a tool, um, a tool that can serve uh, many alternative structural visions. I want to present this um, as a necessary and, and useful part of, of economics. So I want to underscore what I said, just said, which is that economics is a tool. Now, you can take that term uh, to mean two things. One, in its most immediate sense, economics as a tool, is it's, it's a, a, a method that helps us do uh, useful things. Uh, so think about you know, uh, economists as the dentists or the plumbers of society. Um, so when economics is uh, at its most useful, its economists are performing the roles of the plumbers and den dentists of society. Not very glorified, um, you know, either sort of presenting the bill or presenting alternative possible outcomes, uh, presenting a kind of anal analytical clarity um, of what the different range of consequences of different types of interventions might be. Uh, but somebody can, must do it, and there are better and worse ways of doing it. Um, so that's the most immediate sense uh, of what I mean economics uh, as, as a tool. Um, now, the, I use the word tool in a, in also uh, in a, you know, sort of decidedly to, to, to also signal a kind of a second sense, which is more pejorative, uh, which is that when economics gets associated with a particular ideological vision, then it becomes a tool of that vision. Um, now, um, and I think um, that is important because there were certain types of economics that got associated with the, you know, the Keynesian social uh, welfare state version of society. There was a, a, a brand of economics that got associated with neoliberalism. In many ways, what we're doing in this course is trying to think about the economics that might be associated with a structural vision that's um, on which we actually share a lot of uh, common elements, as I think has become clear throughout the course. Um, so we're trying to uh, uh, generate that economics, but I think it's important to dissociate economics as a discipline, as a set of tools, from any particular structural vision. And that dissociation is important because once we separate, for example, economics from the neoliberalism of the last few decades, which, which it has gotten associated with, then we can put that same economics as a set of tools uh, to the service of another structural vision, one that we might like better. But in order to do that, we need to understand that there is that dissociation. And what I said in, um, uh, in my initial uh, comments about sort of the mistake that I think Roberto is making is wanting to see this as one and the same. And, and that's sort of what I'm resisting, uh, because partly I think that different times require different approaches. And, and even though um, the challenges that we, say on, we, we face today on which we agree um, uh, require particular um, types of emphasis, uh, we don't want to think of economics necessarily in the service of any particular ideological or structural vision. And th there's a broader argument there, too, because I actually don't want economists to be the ones who are generating that structural vision because I do not trust economists to do that. And or to invert the question, why should it be economists who are generating that structural vision? 
uh, which is full of normative content, full of uh, judgments uh, about the future of society, about the nature of challenges that we, we face, about the nature of society and politics and the kinds of broader institutions that we should make. It's not the job of economists uh, to render judgment on those things to such a degree that they associate the discipline of economics uh, integrally uh, with that vision, okay? So th that's sort of, I will come back uh, um, to how I think economics d can do this and does that. Uh, but to do that, I want to sort of take a few steps back and first talk about our, our foreground uh, um, theme here um, before I come back to, to, to these issues. So uh, Roberto rightly said that um, uh, the, the, our debate on economics is really sort of the background theme. Um, the foreground theme is about the, um, that the structural vision is, is or the, the, you know, the future of political economy as a system. Um, uh, that's what we're talking about. Now, um, we had, so I want to, let me spend a few minutes um, on uh, that, um, that, that sort of uh, uh, foreground theme uh, because it's also a way of going back to um, the issues that we covered um, throughout, throughout the course. And I think in many ways I hope to make clear this, uh, both the relationship and distinction between economics and that vision. So we had um, a kind of a, um, until neoliberalism took over, we had this, you know, our, our basic political economy insights um, and understanding were based on uh, the idea of um, a kind of a New Deal welfare state um, that was married to a kind of Keynesian economics. Um, and under that vision, um, we viewed society as essentially a kind of um, the result of a, of a political settlement between organized working classes and the business and financial elites. And under that system of political economy, there were a number of key features uh, that organized, regulated, um, and, and stabilized um, uh, the market economy. We had um, social insurance and the various instruments of um, the welfare state. Uh, we had uh, regulated, institutionalized labor markets uh, with collective bargaining playing a significantly important role. Finance was uh, in, in inherently regulated both domestically and internationally. Uh, technology and production broadly, uh, mostly took the form of mass production. Uh, and the market economy and the aggregate economy was regulated through um, uh, Keynesian policies. The globalization that this system uh, uh, produced was a thin globalization uh, that I associated with the Bretton Woods rules and, and the GATT system. Um, and even though there was significant variation uh, in this model, so for example, we've seen the, the, the um, contrast between the liberal versus coordinated variants of the market economy under the system, I think the, the commonalities were, were much more uh, salient than, than the differences. Was this an ideal system? No, of course not. Um, it left many people outside, in particular if you were not, if you were an outsider to the organized institutionalized labor markets, uh, many racial ethnic minorities and certainly refugee immigrants uh, were left out of the system. And also, um, in many ways, uh, the system failed to adjust, of course, to the um, turbulence of the 1970s, uh, the oil um, crisis, um, the rise in inflation. Um, uh, and uh, that is, in fact, where we sort of moved into the next uh, set of institutional arrangements, uh, what has come to be called the, the, the neoliberal mo model um, or market fundamentalism which in many ways inverted most, if not all, uh, of the tenets of the, the New Deal welfare state uh, uh, model. But of course, as we know, the, the neoliberalism created even greater disparities, um, and, um, and uh, that's where we find ourselves today in the transition, uh, trying to figure out uh, where the, the new uh, direction is going to be. Um, so under the sort of new technological imperatives that we've experienced in the last few decades um, under the pressures of hyper-globalization, deregulated finance, uh, the institutionalization of labor markets, um, the process of deindustrialization and weakening of organized uh, working class, 
um, and, and, and the still dominant sort of neoliberal narrative um, on, um, on, on sort of um, uh, what prevails as sort of post-Keynesian uh, macroeconomic management principles, um, stark distinction between markets versus states, uh, prevalence towards austerity, um, and so forth. So that's, uh, that's, those are the things to which uh, many of these reactions are, are, are targeted at. So um, we've talked in this course about um, three interconnected challenges, and I want to argue that those interconnected challenges have one root. Um, one is the challenge of inclusion. Right, um, so that's we've talked about the separation between the the, uh, the vanguard and the rear guard, um, uh, rising regional uh, gaps and gaps uh, within the labor market, the disappearing middle, uh, the decline of middle classes, labor market polarization. So that's sort of um, uh, the the challenge of inclusion, uh, bringing the rear forward. The second is the challenge of economic growth and overall productivity growth. Um, so we've talked about how productivity growth has slowed down in the advanced countries and where developing countries under the influence of premature deindustrialization and more so now with the COVID pandemic, they're facing a period of, of not just declining but very low, possibly negative growth uh, with poverty reduction. So second big challenge is a growth challenge and productivity challenge. Uh, which both uh, advanced and developing countries face. And the third, which is sort of in many ways the background to our discussion and occasionally has come to the foreground, but it's a kind of a political challenge that our polities, our democratic polities are um, uh, not healthy. Uh, we're facing sig significant difficulties in maintaining or in the case of many developing countries, establishing uh, pluralist uh, democracies. So the three channels, the inclusion challenge, the growth challenge, and the political challenge. Now, I list them in that form because I do believe that there is one essential root factor that connects all these three challenges together, um, and that's the scarcity of good middle class jobs. So this fundamental labor market problem, which is that our economies have not been generating uh, enough adequate numbers of, of um, good, um, high quality, productive jobs uh, is at the root simultaneously of all three of these things. Uh, um, on the one hand, uh, the scarcity of um, good jobs undermines the middle class, economic insecurity is directly rooted, is directly the cause of labor market polarization, decline of middle classes, is at the root of inclusion of our problems or the challenge of inclusion. It is also at the root in many ways of the growth and productivity challenge because uh, the disappearing middle uh, also is reflected in the uh, lack of the diffusion of productive technologies and productive opportunities throughout the rest of society. So when productivity gets bottled down at a, in a sort of a thin sliver of um, sort of um, uh, 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 um, high productivity firms, advanced sectors, it's not only inclusion that suffers, it's also overall productivity, overall economic growth that suffers uh, because uh, you're not, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, the overall productivity and growth is constrained by this lack of diffusion of these technologies and high productivity employment opportunities throughout the rest of society. So scarcity of good and middle class jobs is also in many ways directly causally linked um, to um, uh, the, the growth challenge. And finally, I think uh, labor market polarization and the scarcity of good jobs is also causally linked to the problems of our politics, the problems of our politics, uh, where we see um, that these labor market worries, labor market concerns, uh, um, decline in productive employment opportunities, quality jobs, uh, which shows up um, through um, sort of the, the process of deindustrialization, inability to address uh, trade shocks, uh, is also what has encouraged the rise of authoritarian, personal, personalistic, uh, strongman politics um, that um, is uh, usually takes often takes the, the form of right wing authoritarian populism. Uh, so that, um, so the, the, the kind of rise of authoritarian populist movements is also linked uh, to these economic anxieties 
um, uh, associated with what's happening um, in, in li labor markets and the, the, the weakness of, of, of good jobs. So um, that, in many ways, uh, sums up um, our, my, my perspective on sort of um, where uh, we think we need to go. And I've argued um, that you know, we can't go back uh, to the welfare state uh, Keynesian consensus that uh, prevailed um, at before, uh, the, before neoliberalism. Uh, because essentially the, um, the Keynesian welfare state uh, model uh, presumed essentially that, uh, that good middle class jobs would be available uh, to all once you invested enough in education and, and fo focus you know, enough on social uh, insurance and spending on social sectors. Um, and that you basically, you know, you needed to take care of, you know, you take care of those that were temporarily unemployed or those that fell through the cracks uh, through illness or disability, uh, but that you did not necessarily have to actively um, uh, intervene in the productive sphere uh, to support and, and, and encourage the growth of supply side um, uh, 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 jobs. Um, so today, I think what is happening is much more that this, this inequality and economic insecurity are structural problems uh, that are driven by technological uh, and, and other secular trends. And then when technology and the forces of hyper-globalization hollow out the middle of the employment distribution, we end up with a structural uh, problem uh, that exhibits itself in the form of permanently, uh, permanent precarity or permanently bad jobs and depressed uh, regional labor markets. So I think that n requires a different strat strategy that's going to tackle uh, the good job creation directly. If you remember the three by three matrix of different types of policies, that hones us, uh, that, that forces us to focus directly on sort of that middle cell uh, in, that, in that matrix uh, away from the pre-production and post-production uh, interventions on which um, traditional welfare state and, and Keynesian macroeconomic management uh, tended to focus on. Okay, um, so that's all sort of really mostly about the foreground themes. Um, how does this connect um, with the, this background thing of the, the, the role of, of, of economics? Now, as I said, Economics uh, is a tool. Um, it has to be a servant to ideology. If you want, you know, you know, I call it ideology, call it structural vision, uh, but it's a tool that's going to serve it. Now, um, I think the role that economics uh, plays in this is intimately linked with the idea uh, that a uh, market economy is not just one thing, that it's inherently malleable, and that the institutions on which it depends, that help create them, uh, regulate them, stabilize them, legitimize them um, uh, in accordance with societal goals, uh, can take a variety of different forms. So there's no fixed sort of blueprints uh, for such how such institutions can be designed. What economics does, I think, at its best, uh, is help discipline our thinking uh, about these institutional alternatives. So the plasticity of institutions is married to the variety of wage in, ways in which economics helps us think about um, uh, these consequences. And here I disagree uh, very strongly with what uh, Roberto said at, at, at one point. He said that, um, that in, in contemporary social science and in economics in particular, that uh, there is, uh, that the link between insight into the actual and uh, imagination uh, about the adjacent possible, uh, that link has been severed. I think that's actually uh, at best only partially true. Um, I think it may be true that many contemporary practitioners of economics do not necessarily exhibit much of that imagination. But I think insight about what existing what works currently and what doesn't work uh, is extremely important to, ex uh, to, to extend that logic uh, into what might or might not work uh, into um, as sort of the, you know, the, in the adjacent possible, that is in terms of 
uh, changes around the existing institutions. Um, so if we're thinking about different labor market institutions, different wage contracting systems, sectoral wage boards, minimum wages, different um, uh, bargaining schemes. We have no other ways of ex ante uh, thinking through their likely consequences uh, other than through various theoretical frameworks uh, that economics provides, whether it's competitive analysis, whether it's the analysis of imperfect markets, whether it's the economics of information, of, um, and, and contract theory. Um, secondly, we have no way of iterating and revising our policies and understanding whether something is working or not, other than the kind of empirical analysis or the tools of empirical analysis that economics provides. Um, that could be econometric analysis, it could be uh, randomized controlled trials, uh, or it could be informal empirical economic analysis but using the tools of causal inference that economics provides. So both in terms of ex ante analysis, if we're going to, that is what I mean by ex ante analysis, if we're going to change this labor market institutions, this type of corporate governance, this set of R&D incentives, this kind of industrial policy, what is likely to be the consequences, we have no better tools to do that um, than the tools of economics. Secondly, when we engage in a particular reform, reform effort uh, in institutional innovation in the realm of the adjacent possible, um, we have no better tools than the tools of empirical economics, of causal inference, of understanding whether something is working or not. Um, and we are, there's, there's, th those are the tools, in, those are the sense in which um, uh, the tools of economics um, help us. Now, Roberto made fun of uh, economics, um, or one type of economics, it was too polite to say that it was referring to me, uh, but it's sort of this, this notion of equivocating, equivocating economics um, uh, is inherently the strength of economics precisely because it gives us um, the variety of tools, the variety of models with which we can take uh, not just to existing facts, uh, but to alternative facts that we can create first in our, in our imag imagination and then try to create uh, on the ground. Now, I can't stress this enough, um, and here I, I, I go back to um, the, 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 um, the, uh, uh, the definition that uh, Keynes gave of economics. Um, and he said, economics is the science of thinking in terms of models joined to the art of choosing models that are relevant to the contemporary world. Okay? This is the deepest um, uh, definition of economics that I can think of, so let me read it again. Economics is the science of thinking in terms of models joined to the art of choosing models that are relevant to the contemporary world. Okay? Um, uh, I, I think my book, Economics Rules, is on the syllabus, um, and it was assigned for, for this week, I think. I wrote that book before I knew this quote existed. If I knew this quote existed, I probably would not have written the book because it's really all about trying to explain this. I didn't know that Keynes had already said it. Um, but the idea is that um, uh, um, uh, different sets of circumstances require different types of simplifications. So Keynes' own approach to the macroeconomy um, uh, the focus on labor market rigidities and how in the presence of labor market rigidities um, a type of government inter intervention, aggregate demand management, was required to stabilize the economy was a particular model of the economy. Okay? And he set this uh, um, against, uh, in opposition to the what he called the classical view of the macroeconomy. In the classical view of the macroeconomy, uh, these labor market rigidities, using the terminology of economics, these labor market rigidities, which essentially means workers bargaining for their rights and working conditions, did not exist under Manchester liberalism in an earlier era of uh, labor markets where labor was not organized and there was no organized uh, um, labor movement, no labor party representing labor rights, 
then you could assume that the labor market was just like any other market. Wages could go up and down depending on the state of aggregate demand. You would never have unemployment, uh, just like you don't have um, you know, apples uh, you know, not being sold uh, because there's no right price. Uh, okay? um, and he said that the model, the Keynesian model, was relevant to the contemporary world, Keynes's world, because the realities had changed. We had um, organized labor, organized labor movements, and that required a different model of the economy, a different way of thinking of aggregate demand management that was different from the classical model. Now, Keynes didn't live long enough, but by the 1970s, when the world economy got hit, by a range of shocks on the supply side, namely oil prices, um, in an environment where a lot of wages, where costs uh, and other costs were indexed backwards, that is indexed to past inflation, uh, it, was, it became fairly evident that the Keynesian approach to managing the macroeconomy would not have been very useful. Uh, because under the Keynesian model, for example, you could never get simultaneously a rise in prices and a decline in employment. That phenomenon of stagflation was not compatible with a model where the main constraint is on the supply side and therefore on the demand side, and therefore that you need to manage the economy on the demand side. But when shocks predominate on the supply side, that model becomes relatively uh, useless and in perhaps even harmful. Um, so uh, the, the circumstances after the late 1970s would have required different types of models. Um, and, and we got many of those models. Uh, and then in turn, of course, what became, uh, you know, and, and this is you know, where I think economics goes wrong, is once you have a model, you think that's a model, it becomes the model, not a model. Uh, so the many of the so-called new classical models or rational expectations models uh, that were developed in the late 70s um, uh, delivered useful insights, which the Keynesian model didn't. But when, for example, the great the global financial crisis stuck, um, uh, they were, in fact, pretty uh, unhelpful in terms of telling what they ought to do, because those were uh, models which had, in fact, were mostly driven by exogenous supply side shocks um, and didn't tell you what was going to happen if you had a financial implosion and with all, with all you know, sort of implied aggregate demand repercussions. Um, and so there is here sort of, you know, both, a, you, know, a, you know, the positive of this story is understanding, you know, sort of models when they're useful, they're good, um, uh, um, uh, abstract depictions uh, that respond to the needs of the model. Uh, so the Keynesian model did very well for a while. Um, its international extension, in which of course Keynes played a role in creating the whole Bretton Woods system after 1944, did very well. Okay? Um, but sort of the negative um, side to the story, there's a tendency uh, for these models to be associated and to be rigid, to turn to become rigid, in part because they're associated with a particular vision of how society and the economy operates, and that might prevent us uh, from uh, the flexibility, uh, the adaptability to think in terms of sort of what is is this model of the economy still relevant? Where do we pick the other one? Uh, how do we choose the next one? So this is, again, the quote is, economics is the science in, ter in terms of thinking, in terms of models, don't join to the art of choosing models that are relevant to the contemporary world. Let me give you a, briefly an example from microeconomics, which is a discussion about minimum wages. Now, do minimum wages raise or lower employment? Are they good or bad for workers? Okay. Now, it turns out that there are different models. You know, if you take Econ 101 or Rec 10 here, you're likely to focus on purely just one model, which is the perfectly competitive labor market again, in which case an increase in the minimum wage or an imposition in the minimum wage will actually <coughs> result in unemployment, will result in workers not being able to, some workers not being able to find a job, 
uh, because they will be priced out of labor market. Okay? That's only one model. There's another, at least one alternative model where you get exactly the opposite result. So if labor markets are in fact imperfectly competitive, when firms have some bargaining power over who they hire and what wage they pay, so in other words, a monopsonistic labor market, now another model of how the labor market works, in that model, a moderate minimum wage, which actually will actually increase employment because a, a setting a floor below which a wage cannot go essentially transforms a firm that has market power over workers into a firm that has to behave competitively and therefore takes the market power away from these forms, undermines monopsony. Okay? Two models, two very different situations. Many economists believe today that in many labor markets today, it's the monopsony model that prevails, that an increase in minimum wages today from the levels that they exist uh, would actually not be harmful to employment, possibly increase employment and reduce unemployment. But if the minimum wage became $40, would you say the same thing? Would you still stick with the same model? Probably not. Again, you know, the contingency of these models and how and when you would want to, to apply them. So uh, as I like to, to, uh, to say, models are sort of like cognitive maps. They are maps. Uh, they necessarily distort the underlying reality, just like a subway map or a bike map or a highway map are, is not an exact replica of the underlying geography. If it were exact replicas of um, the uh, underlying geography, they would be completely useless, right? You cannot take a one-to-one -one map uh, to you know, ride your subway or bike or even you know, drive on the highway. You need a particular simplification or abstraction that's going to leave a lot of the details out. And that's why I think also the criticism, not one that uh, Roberto made, but a criticism that you often hear about economic models as being unrealistic, uh, not capturing enough aspects of the reality, right? uh, that's a, not a bug, uh, it's a feature. And it's what makes economic models useful. Now, the mistake that we often make, however, is sort of taking the wrong map with us, right? If you're going to drive on the hub, you know, highway, you know, taking a subway map with you, that's going to be totally useless, and that's why often economics or economists go astray. Um, but that's not an argument against the maps. Uh, it's an argument about not taking the second part of Keynes's quote um, to heart, which is you know, figuring out how to use the relevant models to apply them uh, to, to, to reality. Now, um, so I want to, to come back to the, to the, to the, um, uh, to the points that, that I made with. One is to that the need to dissociate uh, economics as a way of thinking, uh, economics as a discipline, from any particular structural vision, uh, not because economics is not useful for that, but precisely because it is useful. I think the risk is that we marry economics uh, with any particular structural vision, uh, with uh, we actually um, uh, undermine the usefulness of economics in exactly the same way that economics got tainted uh, in the last few decades by being uh, associated too closely uh, with, with, with neoliberalism. Um, and um, and I will stop here. I'll just make two, two, two points of clarification before we open up. So first, uh, I don't think economists should be the people responsible for imagining alternative structures. I think everyone should be responsible for imagining alternative structures. Uh, all, the, all the disciplines, all the forces of society, I imagine it as a universal task. Uh, it is true that within the encyclopedia of the disciplines, there are two disciplines that have a special proximity to the 
to the imagination of structure. One is political economy, and the other is legal thought. Uh, and we, we might call them the two disciplines of power. Uh, they're directly engaged in this, in this task, but they certainly have no monopoly or duopoly. Now, my second observation is that I also agree with you uh, that economics is not intrinsically associated with a particular structural vision. Pure economics is certainly not. Fundamentalist economics certainly is, by its own admission and, and, and objective. But I think there's no general rule of the association of economics with a particular structure. Uh, I, I think the question is, what do we need? What do we need to, to imagine structure? And I think that's, that's the problem that we have, that we now have no good usable way of thinking or talking about structural discontinuity or structural change. Remember the dilemma that I posed on the first day of class when I said, I propose something to you that's far from what exists. You say that's interesting, but it's, it's utopian. I propose something that's close to what exists. You say that's feasible, but it's trivial. And thus, almost anything that can be proposed in the current climate of opinion is likely to be derided as either utopian or trivial. And I said then, that results from a misunderstanding of the nature of programmatic argument and of transformative practice. It's not about blueprints. It's about successions. It's not architecture. It's music. And any trajectory of change worth thinking about can be mapped at points close to what exists or far from what exists. There is, however, a contingent feature of the history of ideas which has greatly aggravated this problem. And that is that the view of structure that we used to have, the view in classical social theory, the view in Marxism, has become, as I suggested, literally unbelievable. And the contemporary social sciences, on the whole, instead of providing us with an alternative way of thinking and talking about structure, have suppressed the imperative of structural vision. The result is that we have no good way of talking about structure. And if we have no good way of talking about structure, our temptation is to fall back on a surrogate, bastardized conception of political realism, which is that a proposal is realistic to the extent that it approximates what already exists. That's not a way of talking about structure. That's a declaration of intellectual bankruptcy. And that, and that helps explain the situation that we're in. So, we, it, it's, it's not that we don't use the, that we shouldn't use or mustn't use the existing economics in this quandary in which we find us. Of course we must, but w we have to see the situation for what, for what it is. We have no reliable way of thinking and talking about structural discontinuity and structural alternatives in history. I mean, I, 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 you know, I thought we had overcome that quandary because I think once we agree that every um, e every realistic agenda must start uh, by um, a, st a, a series of, of, of small steps or, yes. or, or gradualist movements away from the existing reality, um, then there is no quandary because I think then we also agree um, that um, that we are both open to this series of small steps or gradualist reforms, uh, potentially opening up the path to very radical institutional reform, ultimately in down the line, sort of in the medium to longer term. So we agree on that too. So, so, so we're, we're you know, so, so this is not you know the, the you know the the kind of reform versus revolution dilemma. So either we sort of sweeten the system as it is, or we uh, imagine a very different system but have no way of getting there. So we are talking about sort of realistic steps uh, based on what exists. You know, potentially the only possible area of debate, and I don't even know that we disagree there, is re with regard to whether it is important <coughs> and critical to specify where we want to end up. Uh, in terms of um, you know 
uh, uh, specifying what those smaller steps ought to be. I mean, one view might be, look, as long as these smaller steps are improvements, we should uh, take them and uh, leave our minds open as to where they will eventually lead us. Maybe they'll lead us to somewhere that's not that different from where we are currently. Maybe the social democratic approach of simply you know, tinkering with the system is okay. But we're not presuming that. We're still keeping our mind open that we might end up somewhere very different. The alternative is to say, I, I have a very good idea about where I want to end up in terms of where this alternative structure, alternative vision is. Um, and then I want to ensure that each one of these steps is consistent with our eventually ending up there. But that's the only the possible area of, of debate. Well, you, you, you've stated, as it were, a pragmatic substitute for what I described as a missing vision. Uh, and so the question is, how much more can we aspire to than that? Huh? Uh, a programmatic argument has to describe a direction and has to choose the initial steps by which to begin to move in that direction. Uh, we would want to have a set of ideas that orient us in thinking about direction and, in con and thinking about constraints on our movements from one step to another. We don't have that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not just that we have a rough and ready substitute for that. I don't think that the social sciences as they exist provide us with such a rough and ready substitute. We're very, very far away from that and consequently threatened by this dilemma of the trivial and the utopian that I described. This is where you all come in. Not left. saying is one is one the acceptable model the wave of the future and that, so I think there's a thesis I, I don't know Danny how much you disagree with this or not but so in the West which by many standards is up to now the most successful part of humanity the North Atlantic region the rich industrial democracies the last great moment of institutional and ideological refoundation was the social democratic or social liberal settlement of the mid 20th century. Now, a, a, a thesis that underlies m many of my interventions here is that we now face an accumulating set of problems that cannot be resolved within the terms of that social democratic or social liberal compromise. So one is the hierarchical segmentation of the production system between the vanguards and rear guards. Uh, and this insular character of the new vanguard with tremendous consequences for stagnation and for inequality and standing behind the dilemma that Danny mentioned of the dearth of good middle jobs, the middle part of the job structure. A second is the problem of social cohesion. What's the basis of social cohesion when ethnic and cultural homogeneity are not enough uh, and money is an inadequate social cement? It has to be something else, some way of multiplying the forms of collective action, people doing things together. A third is, is politics. These advanced Western societies have depended on war to be the fuel of change. And the question is how we can have an impulse to transformation 
that doesn't require trauma in the form of economic ruin or military conflict. So the terms of the social democratic compromise have to be reopened and we have to be able to innovate. When we innovate, we can no longer apply the ideas about structural alternatives that we had before, like the Marxist idea, that there's a system waiting for us. So on that view, we don't have to have a project because history has a project for us. History doesn't have a project for us, and therefore we must have a project. And, this, and, and that's how we come back to this discussion of alternatives. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I think we would both agree that there are some societies that manage um, their problems a lot better than others. I mean, there's no question in my mind that, you know, that uh, Denmark or Norway or Sweden, um, that the, the Nordic model um, has been a more inclusive model without sacrificing uh, overall productivity and prosperity than, than the U.S. model or, or the, the Thatcherite model in Britain. Uh, nor am I, you know, you know, would I say that South Korea is is not infinitely better than I mean than, than North Korea, but I think the key point is what Roberto said. I mean that 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 even those societies are, um, to a varying extent, are, are 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 suffering from the same problems. The problems of, in particular, of these these labor market insider versus outsider uh, 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 problems. Um, or, or exist even in, in Sweden or, or, or Denmark. And you can see it in the rise of far right parties there. Um, it gets reflected in politics. So there is, they, they, they are facing those problems as well. And, and there, in fact, there's, there's one margin that has been exhausted that has not been exhausted in the US. I mean, in the US, you can say that the welfare state is underdeveloped, that there is a lot that the US can do by expanding federal government spending on social programs. Um, you know, in Sweden and, 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 and Denmark, you know, that margin is essentially exhausted, so you'll, you'll have to use m different margins. And I think that's in, in, there's a sense in which, in fact, these ideas p potentially might be even more relevant there. But there's a debate about the goal, right, Danny? So what, what, what's the divi how should one understand today the division between right and left? And I would say there, there are two fundamental contrasts. One is the willingness to accept the established institutional arrangements of the market and of democratic politics as the unsurpassable horizon of our political pursuits. That's, what, that's one of the two things that should define the division between right and left. By that standard, almost all the leftists, the democratic leftists in the world today are conservatives. They're on the other side because they don't uh, defy the institutional framework. They don't propose transformation. The second contrast between the right and the left has to do with the goal. The goal is not a rigid equality of circumstance or outcome. The question is, is it natural for human life to be small? Uh, and is it the case that there's only an exception of a few heroes or geniuses or saints or entrepreneurs? Everyone else is condemned to belittlement except when there is some, some, some great emergency, like war, that lifts us up. Huh? Uh, and who are the leftists on this view? The leftists are the ones who say, it's not natural for human life to be small. We can become bigger together. Uh, and the struggle against inequality is subsidiary to this larger pursuit of a shared empowerment. So I think that that, that, that I, that, that double idea, which I've just stated, uh, throws some light on the background of the dis dissatisfaction. 
And you know, there is also the thinking that perhaps economics needs to be grounded more in economic history, um, and and sort of become almost a sub department in the department of history. And my sense is perhaps, Professor Unger, you would prefer an economics department that sits under the faculty of history, uh, or a, is separate, is sort of connected even to it. And you, uh, and I'm curious where you are, Professor Roderick, on that. How do we reconcile sort of economic history and uh, and empiricism? And am I thinking about it wrong? Well, I'm not sure I understood this opposition. History is empirical. It's another form of empiricism, isn't it? I guess it's a different. Yeah, go ahead. I guess the, the, the way that I'm thinking about the distinction is looking at the past and trying to, you know, almost do an accounting of the past, understanding what happened in the past, but then analyzing it via the traditional historical method, of which empirical analysis is one. Uh, or are we trying to create sort of blank slate, formalistic visions of the world deductively via formal mathematical logic? And I see those as perhaps separable, but I don't know. Perhaps they're not. Well, I think this 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 conflict is sort of being played out in 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 the work that uh, um, you know in, in two brands of economic history. So you know, that first of all, economics has become more empirical. That's a very good thing, um, and and lately has pay, began to pay a lot more attention to economic history, which is also a very good thing. Uh, ec economists' foray into economic history, in turn, has created um, a, a kind of uh, a, a, a conflict, or at, at least tensions, between uh, economic historians trained in economics and historians of the economy trained in history, or the historians of the economy. Um, and I think the way that that I think that's relevant to this distinction you're making, and I think they're complementary perspectives. Um, I think most historians, I don't want to talk for historians, but I think most historians would um, have a different idea of understanding history that is more interested in drawing out a kind of a fuller picture, um, multi-factored, um, sort of deeper explanation um, of um, what happens. Um, without necessarily uh, being very interested in drawing out very clear quantitative implications about the effect of one particular thing on another. So I think the comparative advantage, or in fact the, the absolute advantage that economists bring to the study of history is to be able to tease out um, the effects of a particular thing. So for example, just to give an example, what has been the, you know, the effects of uh, British colonialism on India. Um, now, uh, the way that an economic historian would approach this is by significantly narrowing the question by saying, let us, for example, what has been the history, what has been the effect of um, uh, colonial tax administration uh, on the subsequent development of human capital and um, uh, in particular regions of India. Um, and in a way that would give them a kind of a purchase at being able to do empirically the analysis that would ascertain uh, a kind of a causal impact of a particular set of colonial practices on very particular set of, of um, uh, uh, contemporary developmental outcomes. Now, in doing so, of course, they will rely on the analyses and the his, his, you know the work of the historians of the economy because where do you sort of you know draw out the 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 the, the hypotheses and in fact this is uh, a, a point that I think Roberto was referring to is that that in developing causal hypotheses ec economists particularly economic historians uh, will always rely on other disciplines uh, which is the ones where you know they they you know sort of to a lot of development economics really today is really reading what ethnographers say and then seeing can I actually causally and rigorously test this idea. Um, but the hypothesis is really coming from anthropology uh, and outside of economics. Um, so, uh, so, in, so in that way, I think there is a kind of a mutually reinforcing role about what the historians of the economy might do. 
and the economics of, of uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, economic historians can do. So I'd like to think of this as, as mutually reinforcing. There are, there are certain strengths that I think economists bring to the table, uh, but if all economic history was only what ec economists do, I would be very, very, I think, impoverished view of, of history. I think, I think the crucial thing is, with empiricism, is what is the causal theory on which the empirical, from which the empirical study is hanging? Uh, so w what happens in this kind of economics that is a quasi-logic is that the causal, there's very little causal content, as I said. The, the, the scheme of means to end comparative choices of resources under constraints of scarcity is a minimum causality. Uh, and so the, the actual causal theory on which the models depend are either invented on the spot, ad hoc, or they're imported from another discipline like psychology. That's, that's the problem. Now, in the description that you just gave, I think there is an element of not facing a, 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 di a difficult, disagreeable fact about the present situation. And now let me describe it openly uh, at, the risk of, uh, at the risk of being offensive. So the, the, uh, the discipline of economics now in the world is largely under the hegemony of the economics departments of a small group of American research universities. They control the direction. They're the ones that are recognized in this lamentable Nobel Prize. Uh, and uh, th they have a North Star. Now, look at what happens in them. So I'll describe to you the typical profile of what goes on in those departments. So, uh, a kid from the Midwest somewhere is a whiz in mathematics. Uh, then he comes to Harvard and he goes to the mathematics department. Uh, then after a year or two, the mathematics department decides the kid is not a mathematical genius. He's just, he just has mathematical facility. And the department only wants mathematical, quote, geniuses. So the kid then transfers to applied mathematics at Harvard. And after a year or two, he decides he's nothing special in applied mathematics either. Uh, uh, then he goes to the economics department, to the PhD <laughs> program of the economics. That's the third step. So in, in many recent years, the Harvard economics department did not admit a single concentrator in economics from Harvard, but a whole bunch of applied mathematicians. Now, so then you get these people who are applied mathematicians, who know no philosophy, no history, no social theory. They know nothing about anything. And, and, and they, they then go to these departments. They get prestigious positions. After they produce a while, they can begin to speculate. They can do what Bob Solo called the pop sociology that the economists do after they become tenured. Uh, and so that's the situation of the discipline. Now, the, the, we're not going to get Karl Marx's and Adam Smith's out of that situation. So that's, that's, there, there's a problem of the contradiction between the human reality of this discipline and what we need from the standpoint of the interests of humanity. Yes. Okay. In terms of like both going back to like economic history, do you see any role of like sci-fi and in the way that inspired lots of uh, in the entrepreneurship space and technology space, sort of the dystopian or like technological future vision as a way of getting to those sort of like unworldly ideas? And do, do you see that as interrelating with economics as a form of idea generation? Oh, who knows? I mean, that can, that can be a, an an inspiration on the side to loosen our ideas about the real and the possible. But this is serious stuff. I mean, the, the problem is you, you, need, to, you need to know a lot. 
You need to have great intellectual ambition. You need to know a lot. You need to be willing to do what Marx did to spend a thousand nights in the British Library, then write a book that is going to sell 200 copies for the first 20 years, which was the case with Das Kapital. Uh, so th there's this problem. It's, it's not just an epistemic challenge. It's a moral challenge. Someone has to do this. Someone has to take the narrow path, the rocky path, and not the easy path. I, I, I mean, I think we all should do that. I mean, yes, I think, we all should I do that. We all should do that. I, I, I don't, I don't, again, I, you know. What we you, all what should do that, not just the economists. We, we, all yeah. should, yeah, we all should do that, not just the economists. And I, I, and I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more that I think the, um, the training of uh, professional economists is, is severely lacking in terms of emphasis on, on, on history, uh, philosophy, uh, political science, and sociology. Um, uh, I, I totally agree with that too, but I, I, I just don't think that um, you know the, that the you know that it is it is primarily the economists who should be investing in that sort of broader un understanding of, 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 of these you know um, theories. So, so I mean, no, I don't. I mean that that's our discussion. No. I mean, we everyone should, but. Political economy is important. It, 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 uh, together with legal thought, they are perhaps the two most important disciplines. Can I ask a quick, a quick follow up? Like, in, in, it sounds like you're asking for a multidisciplinary approach. Like, someone who just does maths, you're like, like, actually, someone philosophy, politics, law, all of these aspects, uh, even psychology is now blending into economics. Which are the other sort of like spheres of disciplines that you would like to see as part of economics? That's kind of what I meant by like, oh, going into sci-fi or like other, other disciplines. Well, the most important, of course, is philosophy, which we didn't mention. Uh, because the, the great economic theoreticians were philosophers. Uh, and so I would say that, of course, is the most common defect in the education of educated people, an inadequate acquaintance with the history of philosophy. Uh, One of those philosophers was Adam Smith, who also yes. emphasized that it was division of labor that creates productivity. Yes, yeah, yes, but not, 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 not too far, right? <laughs> Since he gave the counterexample himself. What's up? Well, I didn't mean philosophy, the, the academic discipline, right? Uh, I think the distinction between intuition and vision is, is, is a good one. And I, I, and I think you're right. That I, I think that you can't, be, you can't become a good economist without the intuition. So I think that part of it, I think, is respected. But you can become a very good intu in, 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 uh, economist and even win a Nobel Prize uh, uh, without a vision, yeah. which is OK, by the way. <laughs>
Well, we don't really have time to talk about the inflation issue, and it would probably take us too far away from, from what our, our current focus is. Um, uh, but on, on, on the good job, I mean, that just goes back to all the discussions that we had previously in, in this. Um, so I think to summarize very crudely, I would say that, that you know, I've emphasized four kinds of uh, points of focus uh, in, ter in terms of thinking about the good jobs. One is, um, on the um, you know sort of training and skilling part, which is um, linking up training and skilling uh, um, initiatives much more closely uh, with employers and with firms. Uh, so connecting um, education and training programs much more closely with firms, as uh, some of the best sectoral um, workforce uh, training programs do. Second, much more sort of on the on the firm side, like this kind of a revised industrial policy. Um, that focuses on small and medium-sized enterprises on the on the supply side of the labor market, on the demand side of the labor market, rather, uh, working with firms to increase their um, uh, their productive capacity to to hire more good more uh, more workers of the right type. Um, th a third plank has been this discussion on which might be a variant of uh, innovation policies or industrial policies again but focusing on labor-friendly, uh, redirecting technological change in a much more friendly, uh, much more labor-friendly direction. And finally, the fourth is uh, establishing through sort of um, uh, sectoral or otherwise a set of, you know, basically a floor level of protections for workers, whether it's through minimum wages or, or collective bargaining or sectoral wa wage agreements. Uh, that's sort of beefed up by, you know, sort of uh, um, protections against um, uh, social dumping uh, through uh, kind of selective um, uh, trade policies or selective uh, policies on, on uh, international agreements that would, for example, raise the corporate minimum tax and so forth. So, so those would be, again, these are all things that we've talked about much more extensively uh, in the course, but those would be the four planks that I would focus on. Danny, we've come to the end of our time. We so, have come to the end so, of our time. So. Uh, and we won't be doing this next year. So what are your marching orders? What, what are your instructions? To? To me. To you. For the next stage. For the next stage. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, what, what can I say? Um, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, 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 um, I think be kinder to economists. They're only trying to help you. <laughs> They can be your tool <laughs> if you're nice to them. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, other than that, I'm sure you'll do fine. <laughs> well, it's been it's been wonderful uh, doing this, and I'm sure we'll 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 um, we'll we'll go we'll return to it after yeah. next year. Yeah. Well, thank you, and thank you all for your patience. Thank you. Thank you.